Tennant. Hi, Kerry. Happy birthday. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> well, I'm Kerry Howley, a contributing editor at Reason Magazine. I'm Kenan Malik. I'm a writer, broadcaster, lecturer. I'm a senior visiting fellow at University of Surrey. I've just got a book out on race called Strange Fruit, Why Both Sides Are Wrong. And actually, I thought I might show you this, which is uh, the cover of my new book. Which oh, I was hoping that. I was hoping you'd show us, because I only have it in PDF form, which is a lot less photogenic. Uh, right, OK. Well, if you can see this, I'm, I'm not sure you can see this on the, um, on, on the camera, but if you can, it's called... From Fatwa to Jihad, and it's about the Rushdie affair and its legacy. It's out in the spring. Okay. Um, well, I was hoping we could talk about well, about strange fruit and and, and sure. why both sides in the race debate are wrong. So you can just sort of tell everyone who's watching uh, exactly what they've got wrong, and that's the best kind of dialogue, <laughs> I think. Um, so you have some very nuanced, interesting views about the biological reality of race. I think that the Typical educated um, American stance would be that we have these social categories, race, that are important for various reasons, but they don't map on to any actual scientific reality. Uh, why is that wrong? Well, there are clearly real genetic differences between human populations, and the scientific study of these differences are very important in helping us to unravel the roots of disease to develop new medicines mm -hmm. and clinical techniques to uh, unpick details of human history and migrations. Um, but such genetic differences are not the same as racial differences because race describes a way not just of categorising human beings but of selecting certain categories based usually on skin colour or appearance or descent as being of particular importance. And racial thinking divide human beings into a small set of discrete groups, each of which possesses you know, a fixed set of traits and abilities. And it regards the differences between these groups as the defining feature of humanity. And all these beliefs, I think, run counter to scientific views of population differences. OK. Uh, but I mean, I mean for, yeah. example, for example, I mean, let's, let's give you a, a good example. Now, different populations, um, if, if you take medicine, different populations clearly show different patterns of disease and disorders. Uh, North Europeans, for instance, are more likely to suffer from cystic fibrosis than other groups. Tay-Sachs uh, particularly affects Ashkenazi Jews. Beta blockers appear to be uh, less effective on African Americans than those of uh, European descent. And yet race is not a particularly good guide to disease or, in fact, to any other kind of um, uh, human diversity. Um, we know, for instance, that sickle cell anemia is a black disease except that it isn't. Sickle cell is a disease of populations originating in areas with high incidence of malaria. Some of these populations are black and some are not. Um, you can find the sickle cell gene in equatorial Africa, parts of southern Europe and southern Turkey, parts of the Middle East, and in large swathes of central India. Most people, however, know about sickle cell because... Uh, because they know that African Americans suffer disproportionately from the trait. And given popular ideas about race, people all, m automatically assume that what applies to black Americans applies to all blacks and only to blacks. So it's the social imagination, not the biological reality of race, that turns sickle cell into a black disease. I see. Uh, but is there, is there not some role for, uh, for race as a rough proxy if, if a... A certain race walks into my office as a doctor, um, is it not helpful for me to even consider the... I mean, there is some connection between um, people who present with dark skin and sickle cell anemia. Should I, should I just completely ignore that? Oh, not at all. But, but the thing to remember is that, um, that there are genetic differences between populations. So the way we socially divide up populations is not always the best way to define the populations that are important for particular questions. Um, another way of putting it is that the, the character of race in scientific research is ambiguous because race is, in effect, a social category but with biological consequences. See, geneticists can distinguish between all sorts of populations. Some of these distinctions are useful scientifically, some are not. Whether or not they're useful depends on the questions we want to ask mm -hmm. and the context in which we ask it. But the populations that geneticists distinguish are largely socially defined ones, and that's because there's no such thing as a natural human population. Things like migration, intermarriage, war and conquest, forced assimilation, 
voluntary embrace of new or, or of multiple identities, um, religious or cultural or uh, national or ethnic or racial, any number of social and economic and other barriers to interactions and hence to, to reproduction. Social rules for defining populations, such as the one drop rule in America, which, mm-hmm. you know, which suggests that Barack Obama is black. Um, which is what you know. While we regard him as a black man, um, all these and many other social factors impact upon the character of a group and transform its genetic profile. And that's why racial categories are actually very, very difficult to define scientifically. If, if you read a scientific paper um, which uses racial categories, there's a, there's, there's a big distinction between the tightness of the way that such a paper would define physiological processes or, 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 or genes, or specific genes, and the looseness of the language when it, uses, uh, when it comes to racial differences. In fact, what scientists do is import um, popular notions of race um, mm-hmm. into scientific discussions. But the point is that many of the ways in which we customarily group people socially, you know, by race, by ethnicity, by nationality, by religious affiliations, by geographical locality and so on, are not arbitrary from a biological point of view. Um, Members of such groups often show greater biological relatedness than to randomly chosen individuals um, because such groups have often been ghettoised by Mm. a coercive external authority, as in South Africa, for instance, during the apartheid era, or have chosen to self-segregate from other groups. And hence they're inbred to a certain degree and act as, as in a way that you suggested, as surrogates, however imperfectly, for biological relatedness. So categories such as, I don't know, African-American or people of Asian descent or Ashkenazi Jew can be important in medical research, not because they're natural racists, but because they are, if you like, social representations of certain aspects of genetic variation, and therefore they become useful in addressing questions about human genetic differences and and, and genetic commonalities. And 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 the irony in all this is that in order, to, you know, in order to study genetic differences between populations, what s- scientists actually use are social uh, uh, mm. uh, categories, not, not natural ones. But that's what you need in order to, to, to study uh, uh, genetic uh, variation. And so there's a kind of ambiguity in the, in the way we, we understand race. Um, categories are social, but there are biological distinctions between them. It is, it is and a there bit are biological consequences of those uh, the, the, the origin of the, the social division of races can seem so shockingly arbitrary. I mean, Richard Rodriguez talks about the way, uh, you know, Nixon invented Hispanics in 1972. This entire oh. social category by which, you know, people define themselves and we define others was just kind of pulled out of thin air in a way by American immigration law and, and, and the census. Well, that's right. If you look at census categories over the past century, a century, they they, they um, uh, vary quite widely, and, and you kind of carve out new categories mm-hmm. and, um, as as the political social need arises. Uh, so yes, the social categories um, are very very different. You take the qu- Asians in America. Asians means what science, what what. Um, uh, uh, some scientists would call East Asians. In other words, um, largely Japanese. Uh, Koreans, Chinese, and so on. In Britain, Asians means South Asians, um, Indians, Pakistanis, mm. uh, Bangladeshis, and so on. But in a, in a kind of classical um, racial, uh, 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 scientific racial categorizing, um, South Asians are Caucasians, in, a, in other words, the same race as Europeans. But of course, popularly, they're seen as d- different races. Right, right. So all, the, all, all, the, all these distinctions and, and, and the way we categorize people socially. Um, uh, creates uh, 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 all sorts of confusions. Nevertheless, it is also b- precisely because there are um, uh, biological consequences of social categorization. There mm-hmm. can be, in certain circumstances, if used carefully, important in medical and scientific research. Interesting. Uh, in your book, you talk about this uh, sense that I think a lot of people have that racism is, is a human inevitability, that we're just wired that way. Mm. Um, but that doesn't seem, given the history you give, to be... Uh, the, the, there was a sense of universalism, for instance, in the Enlightenment that we seem to have lost today. Is that accurate? Yes. I mean, I, th- I think the point is that uh, if you look historically at the idea of race, um, it changes very much over time. The Greek notion of human differences is, is very different from 
uh, the medieval notion of human differences, which is very different from um, the Enlightenment and, and, and the contemporary notion of human differences. Um, so uh, the way we understand human differences uh, as, as varied over history and, uh, and, and the idea that human differences are set in our biology is actually a very, very new notion. Mm. Um, it's, it's certainly the case that Greeks saw differences between human populations. But the key difference for them was not biological, but civilizational in a sense, the, the distinction between uh, 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 the civilised and the barbarians. So where you ranked was kind of an accident of birth? Uh, that's right. I mean, if you, if you go back to, if you, if you go to um, the Middle Ages, if you go to Europe in, you know, 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th century, um, th- there's a tendency to view uh, differences in terms not of biology or, or, of, or, or, or of inheritance, but of, in terms of faith and law. Um, people were, 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 were um, uh, one people according to their relationship to their faith and to the law. And it's only uh, much more recently the question of uh, biological differences becomes so important, mm. and, it, and it does so um, through the 18th and 19th centuries. And it, it does so, I think, in a, in a, in a way differently from where the, the way in which most people understand it. I think the, the key question is, is that what develops in the 18th and 19th century is a, is, is a seeming contradiction between an abstract notion, abstract belief in equality, which arises out of the Enlightenment, and the reality of a world which seems increasingly unequal, um, and race becomes a way of understanding that contradiction, because people come to see, uh, c- come to explain that that, con- that that difference between an abstract uh, uh, belief in equality and the reality of an unequal world by saying that certain people are by nature incapable of progress, incapable of being equal, um, and so you can see that idea developing through the 18th and 19th centuries. It's also interesting, and if you, if you, if you, if you look at the, the 19th century uh, um, idea of race, it's very different from um, the 20th century notion of race. Now, we think about race largely in terms of skin colour. Um, we, we, you know, we talk about blacks and whites, and, um, uh, and, and we define people lo- um, uh, uh, different races largely in terms of skin colour. Well, in the 19th century, um, particularly in Europe, the distinction was less about um, skin colour than it was about uh, social status and class. Hmm. Um, so the people, the poor of Bethnal Green, there, there, there are great um, uh, uh, articles in, in, in newspapers from, from the mid-19th century in Britain about the poor of, uh, the, of Bethnal Green, which is a, which is a, a, a poor area of, of, of East London, um, and how they were uh, like uh, the, the relationship between them and the rich is a bit like the relationship between Negroes and whites in America. Um, and, and they talk about them as a, as a distinct, different race. So the whole nation, na- notion of race has changed considerably um, over, over the past 200 years. I mean, it's a very new phenomenon, a uh, very new idea. But even uh, over the past two, 300 years, the idea of race has changed quite considerably. Um, but what, in, in the present, you're quite critical of what you see as a sort of emergent race realism on the left. Is that right? Mm. I mean, uh, this idea that your identity is completely wrapped up in your biological descent um, seems to be quite constraining. Yeah, I think we've become obsessed by the question of identity and culture has come to bear the burden of race, if you like. And there's a tendency, growing tendency, to view culture and cultural identity as fixed and to view groups as homogenous wholes. Um, I think multicultural policy... um, uh, is based on, 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 on such an idea. And an identity, in a sense, I, I put it like this, an identity has become a bit like a private club, and once you, mm-hmm. you know, join up, you have to abide by the gr- rules. But unlike, say, the Groucho or the Garrick or whatever the equivalent is in, in America, it's a private club you must join. So you know, if you're black or if you're Muslim or if you're Native American, there are certain authentic ways of behaving as such. Um, otherwise, you're not authentically um, black or uh, Muslim or Native American. I mean, it comes very clearly in relation to the, dis- the, the debate about Islam, mm-hmm. that only certain kinds of Muslims are authentically Muslims. Um, in fact, mm-hmm. you know, the, 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 the Muslim community, there's, there's no such thing as the Muslim community. There are many Muslim communities. There are many strands within the Muslim community. Um, but secular Muslims, for instance, aren't seen as real Muslims. Only 
uh, fundamentally religious Muslims yeah. are seen as real, authentic Muslims. Now, when I grew up in, in the 80s in Britain, there was a very strong uh, secular tradition um, within uh, Muslim communities. See, these days, when we talk about radical in the Muslim context, we mean uh, someone who's religiously fundamentalist. Well, 25 years ago, it meant the very opposite. Radical in the, in, in the Muslim context meant uh, someone who was militantly secular, someone like mm. me. Mm. Um, and, and that shift has, 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 has changed because only certain types of Muslims are, not, are seen as authentically so. Um, others are, you know, they're not Muslim. And therefore, um, you know, this notion of authenticity constrains um, uh, the way people uh, uh, sh should or have to behave because they have a certain identity, certain ways of behaving, certain scripts, life scripts they have to follow. Um, I mean, doesn't this play out in certain interesting ways across the culture? I mean, this the obsession with genealogy, the, this idea that I need to find a story about myself to to give myself an authentic identity. I need to find through my ancestors who I really am, and various cultural products. I mean, this this cultural script of I'm an American immigrant, um, but I don't feel real somehow until I've gone back to my homeland, even if I've never been there and have no actual connection or, or social network there. Well, that's right. Uh, it's, it's interesting how identity is becoming much more um, tied up with genetics. Mm -hmm. um, um, you know, you can get these DNA testing kits now where um, you, 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 you test your, 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 your DNA, find out where you come from. And it's as if that tells you who you really are. Right. It, was, it was a programme, um, a, a documentary on the BBC a few years ago called Motherland, where they uh, took three uh, uh, black Britons, tested their, 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 their DNA and traced them back um, uh, uh, to, to their ancestry. Now, there are major problems with, with, with the science of that, uh, largely because... Um, you have lots of ancestors, and, and what they were trading was just one, one set of ancestors. But yeah, nevertheless, yeah. Um, a, a, accepting that, what happened was that there, there was one woman, for instance, um, who found her ancestors came from a small island uh, off the coast of West Africa. And the next thing you found out, you know, she'd flown off out, out there, she was there, the camera's following her, and she's, she's saying, I found who I am, I know where I am, this is home for me. She's never been there in her life. Yeah. And, yet it's home. and the whole notion of black identity in that sense, or, you know, identity in general, but, 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 but in this case, black identity, which 20 years ago would have been political mm. um, or, or cultural, has now become increasingly uh, biological or genetic. You know, you want to find your tribe and, and, and that tribe is somehow in your genes. Yeah, I think that this emerges especially in adoption law in, uh, or adoption norms in which mm. I, you know, adopt a Chinese child mm. and I'm, I'm perceived as taking something from her if she isn't right. given Mandarin lessons or something like that. Um, as well, this is her, her, you know, cultural heritage. And even though she may never see this place past the age of five days, um, somehow, you know, that's perceived as a crime against the child. Well, that's right. There was a, there was a, there was somebody I know who who had adopted a a, a child um, who uh, was born in India, and he he, he asked me in all earnestness um, because and, and she'd been brought. He's a Catholic, and, and she'd been brought up um, as a Catholic. And he asked me in all earnestness, um, did I do wrong, and should, should I have brought her up as a Hindu? Um, and it's just bizarre. It really is bizarre. <laughs> I mean, wh why why the fact that she was brought, born in India? Uh, why should that uh, dictate uh, what faith or if any she should be brought up in. Right, right. Um, now, how this connects to this idea of um, cultural in inertia, I guess, the idea that we we are born with a culture and we must remain in that culture because it is who we are and, and any uh, any lessening of, of that particular thick culture makes me less of who I am. Uh, it, it relates to cultural preservation, and this is another thing that you're quite critical of in the book. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, it, 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 just as you said, that there's, there's, a, there's the idea that um, there's a problem if cultures get lost, and we need to preserve cultures. Um, you can see that in Canada, for instance, in, in relation to uh, the preservation of French culture in, in Canada, um, or the preservation of Native American culture in, in, in the U.S., uh, and this no whole notion of cultural loss, cultural preservation, cultural decay, um, 
it's, it's, it's very, very reactionary. Because in one sense, you can never lose your culture. You know, French culture is what French people do. Native American culture is what Native Americans do. Culture um, is, is embodied in uh, the behaviour, the rules, the, the institutions, the, the activities of real living people. Mm -hmm. And you can only lose one's culture. It only makes sense if culture is defined not by what people are doing in the here and now, but what they should be doing. And what should they be doing? Well, they should be doing what their ancestors were doing. Right, and so right. culture gets de defined by uh, biological descent. And biological descent is a polite way of talking about race. So we come kind of full circle. Cultural authenticity, cultural preservation is just uh, another way of talking about race um, with, without the, the, the opprobrium of, 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 of racial talk, if you like. I guess, from my perspective, the reason why this I, I see this trend as threatening is that I cover immigration at Reason, and it worries me this idea that the, that the left could be defending um, a sort of cultural purity as mm. as as a justification for um, closed borders. Mm -hmm. Well, that's right. I, th I think it's, it's a it's an interesting um, slippage that's taken place in, in this debate about multiculturalism because there. Are, Multiculturalism um, has come to mean two different things. One is the lived experience of diversity. The other is a set of political policies um, uh, that are managed to manage that diversity. Mm -hmm. And um, in a sense, that, that set of pol political policies to manage diversity is rooted in the idea that if you belong to a culture, you have to stay in that culture. That, that there are certain ways of behaving as part of that culture and we should respect institutionalise um, those aspects of cultures and, and the differences between cultures. In fact, multicultural, as, as a set of political polities, undermines, to, it seems to me, much of what is good about um, diversity's lived experience. Di what's good about diversity's lived experience is that it allows you to broaden your horizons, to think about you know, beyond your own narrow identity, to mm -hmm. think about other values, uh, other lifestyles, other ways of, 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 of living, asking you know, is this better or is it worse? Um, would, would those values be better than mine? Would my values, are my values better than theirs? And therefore it becomes a means of creating a more universal language of citizenship, if you like. Whereas multiculturalism as a, as, as a political process kind of, um, uh, denies that by, by um, undermining uh, the, the capacity for such dialogue and, 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 and debate uh, and, and to make such judgments uh, because it says people belong... To, you know, it puts people in certain ethnic cultural boxes um, and ensures that, that they stay there. So, yes, th there's been a, a confusion of immigration and, and multiculturalism so that um, people who are pro-immigration tend to be pro-multiculturalism hmm. and people who are anti-immigration tend to be anti-multiculturalism. Someone like me who's pro-immigration, anti-multiculturalism... Um, for, for many people, it doesn't make sense to, to look at the world in that fashion. I, th I think that's, that's an absurd, that's an absurd uh, way, way of thinking about it. I think, you know, um, being pro-immigration, anti-multiculturalism seems to me a perfectly valid way and, and the only way, really, to, to look at the world. Right. I mean, I think that the, the only way to respect individuals is to see culture as essentially fluid because what starts happening, once you say, this is what the culture is, we need to preserve it right now, um, is that you inevitably start constraining individual rights. Uh, and, and that burden ha actually has to fall on women at some level because it's going to be their job to reproduce the culture. Um, they're going to be the boundary markers. Uh, and inevitably questions about the decay of the culture and um, end up a, a quest to be questions about the birth rate. Um, this is the sure, hysteria it's, it's, we I see mean, in it, you know, Singapore. It's, it's always the most Israel. vulnerable groups, um, vulnerable sections of, of, of those communities that, that, um, uh, that, that, that are worst hit by these kinds of politics, policies. I think part of the problem is that there's a kind of constant slippage between the idea of humans as culture-bearing creatures and, and, and the idea that humans have to bear a particular culture. Mm -hmm. I mean, no human lives out, can live outside of culture, but then no human does. But to say that no human can live out of culture, uh, out, outside of a culture is not to say that they have to live inside a particular one. Or to say, as you say, that particular cultures must be fixed or eternal. I mean, to view humans as culture-bearing is to see them as social beings and as transformative beings. It suggests that humans have, 
uh, the capacity for change, for progress, for the creation of universal moral political forms through reason, through dialogue and so on. But to view humans as having to uh, bear specific cultures is to deny such a capacity for transformation and suggest that every being, every human being is so shaped by a particular culture that to change or undermine that culture would be uh, to undermine the very dignity of that individual. You know, that the biological fact of being Jewish or Bangladeshi somehow makes a human being incapable of living well, except as a participant of Jewish or Bangladeshi culture, as it is in a particular definition of Jewish or Bangladeshi culture. Yeah, it argues um, against the very possibility of mobility. Uh, that's absolutely a change of social progress, yeah. I mean, you know, all change requires cultural change. Social change requires cultural change. And, uh, without, without cultural change, you cannot have social change. You cannot have social progress. But, I mean, surely there is a loss associated with a language dying out. Well, yes and no. I mean, I... Um, I mean, there's I've, also a cost to maintaining a language. There's a cost to you know, trading some uh, tribal people in Upper Burma the their tribal language, which might not be particularly useful, and I'm... I'm not sure I would want to impose that cost on, you know, a classroom full of children, but I can also acknowledge that there's a loss involved with just letting it die out. And these need well, to be I, 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 I don't see why, because um, language is about communication. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and therefore, people use the language they need to communicate. Lang- languages have always died out. Um, you know, the English we speak now is very different from the English um, uh, spoken uh, 500 years ago. Um, it's no loss. It's no loss that uh, we don't speak the kinds of language that existed in Europe um, 500 years ago or, or 1,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago. Um, there, is, there, is, there is a tendency to see uh, the kind of romantic view of language embodying a certain view of looking at the world. Mm-hmm. Um, um, and therefore, if you lose a language, you lose a certain way of looking at the world. I think that's uh, romantic hogwash. <laughs> Uh, is it is is that not an argument against against historical preservation at all? I mean, you can you can see a language just as a, as as a history in itself, or, or part of a history that's you know as valuable as anything kept in in the Smithsonian in museum. Yeah, you can do, um, but <laughs> unless you want to keep uh, an individual or a group in a museum in the Smithsonian. Um, <laughs> right. You're going to have to accept that languages will change, will evolve, will die out, new ones will, will, will come into being. That, that's the nature of human progress, human life. That's the nature of being human. Okay. Um, so what are the forces for universalism? I, I, there, one of my favourite theorists is named Yi Fu Tuan, and he talks about going to a Christian school, he's Chinese, going to a Christian school when he was like seven or something, and being completely bowled over by the idea of universalism, this Christian idea that um, that we're all equal or, or we all exist under God. Uh, what other forces in the culture push toward that? Well, um, in a sense, the, the, uh, the Christian notion of uh, universalism I mean, and... and, and um, uh, universalism is is a very important part of the Christian tradition, but it was also a constrained um, tradition because those who were not Christians were denied the benefits of Christian universality. Yeah. Um, um, uh, and the, the, the the real notions of universalism develops develops only in in the um, 17th and 18th century um, through through the Enlightenment and particularly through the Radical Enlightenment. Um, Jonathan Israel's wonderful series of books on the radical enlightenment um, shows you know that there's a distinction between the mainstream enlightenment um, which most people know and talk about people such you know uh, 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 figures such as Kant and Locke and Hume mm-hmm. and so on and the the radical uh, uh, enlightenment philosophers people like Spinoza uh, and Leibniz and and Condorcet uh, and so on and it's, it's out of the radical enlightenment that, that the modern notions of universal, universality and equality arises. So I, I, I don't think, you know, there are, uh, universalism isn't embodied in particular historical cultures, but I think in particular mm-hmm. political traditions. And the major traditions that draw on the enlightenment 
um, whether liberalism or Marxism, are both rooted in that universalist outlook. And anti-universalism universalism is rooted in the counter-enlightenment um, romantic tradition. Historically, though, a, a, a major shift has taken place over the past um, three or four maybe uh, decades over the past half century. Historically, the left was universalist, the right was particularist. In recent years, however, this has reversed. The left has abandoned universalism for, uh, uh, for, for ethnic particularism and multiculturalism, and the right has embraced a kind of distorted notion of universalism and in, with, with its embrace of the free market. So there, there's a kind of shift that's taken place. Is there? I wonder if there's a sense in which the nation-state just in itself pushes against universalism. I mean, we tend to think of, of progress and, and history as moving towards cosmopolitanism, but the sort of pre-World One, World War I empires in Europe, were these were polyglot, and after post-war, the, you had sort of all these ethno-nationalist uh, nation-state camps, and all of these, er, all of these different states have an interest in creating a separate history, sort of justifying their existence? Well, I think there are positive and negative aspects of, 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 um, of uh, nation-building uh, and, and nationalism. I mean, on the one hand, nationalism is about overcoming the parochial, parochial aspect of uh, a, a, any nation, so that um, you know, the creation of the French nation, for instance, was about overcoming uh, the parochial aspects of, the, of Bretons right. and and, and, and of Languedocs and so on, and creating a, a nation that, that overcame that. So there was a universalist impulse in that. But on the other side, as, as you suggest, um, uh, 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 nationalism is about uh, uh, imposing one's, uh, w- one's own particularism against other forms of particularism, other forms of nationality. So, so it's, 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 a, it's, it's a double-edged sword. Right. Um, and I think in, in recent years... Um, it, it, it's the second aspect of nationalism that has predominated, um, and, it, and in that sense, it's become a quite a reactionary way of, 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 of thinking about um, oneself and one's identity. Right. So once I hit the boundaries of my imagined community, which at this point in history is the nation state, uh, I have an interest. I, I can assert an interest in cultural preservation, as we were talking about, and I can argue for closing the borders or. Some sort of new yes, policy the, the, to increase the, the birth rate or, or something of that along yeah. those lines. The, 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 we've got to remember that um, you know the, the, the nationalist movements, third world nationalist movements, were, when they began in in the um, uh, early twentieth century and when they gathered uh, momentum in the uh, post Second World War, uh, were uh, quite progressive movements. Mm-hmm. Um, because the, the, their, their vision of themselves was not in that kind of narrow cultural sense, but much broader. Um, uh, in, in a sense of uh, wanting freedom for themselves and for, for their people, uh, in order to decide their futures. Um, so, you know, we, we need to be a bit careful about the way we, we understand uh, nationalism and nationalist movements. I, I do think there, there are two aspects of it. it sure. It's just that in more in recent years, um, it, it's it's that. Uh, uh, the, the political aspects of nationalism has reduced and become, as you said, much more uh, cultural, historical, um, uh, uh, about preserving uh, a, a kind of narrow parochial notion of what it is to be uh, British or American or French or Irish or, or, or so on. Sure, but anyway, as you say, the very uh, in America, the very ability of a black man to say, I'm an American too, has been really important to equality. I mean, th- there is something mm. to, to the expansion of the boundaries as far as they've gone. Absolutely. Um, and, and that's true not just of America. It means, sure, of course. Know, when, I, when I was growing up, um, what was important for me was to be treated the same as everybody else. Right. Um, and and, and to, be, to, be th- to be seen as British and to be accepted as British. Um, and similarly in, in, in America... Um, you know, and, and uh, which is one of the reasons why uh, Barack Obama's victory um, has meant so much, um, because it seems an expression of that of, of, of that feeling. So, where do you think this is going? I mean, do you feel like we're becoming even more obsessed with the idea of identity and uh, biology as destiny, or are we moving toward a more cosmopolitan, globalist worldview? I think we're becoming far more obsessed with the question of identity uh, um, and um, we're having a much more parochial way 
of looking at the world. In a sense, um, if you look over the past 20 years, um, the politics of ideology has given way to the politics of identity. Then that's mm-hmm. been the big shift that's taken place. And so, um, and it, as that has happened, um, notions of social affiliations have changed. People um, no longer think of um, themselves and who they affiliate with in terms of um, uh, the uh, politics, but much more in much in much narrower terms um, uh, 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 of culture and history and heritage. So, you know, the questions people ask themselves isn't what kind of uh, society do I want, and and what what kind of uh, collective do I need to create in order to, in order to find the society the kind of society we want? But rather, who am I? What's my history? What's my heritage? And, and so, identities become much more uh, about history and culture and uh, and heritage rather than about uh, uh, political affiliation. Do you not sense some backlash against that worldview? In what way? Um, it. I mean, there there are always going to be pressures for assimilation. Uh, yeah, but but assim- I mean, uh, it, it, the trouble with um, the assimilationist debate is um, I'm an assimilationist, but the way that um, uh, the, the 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 assimilationist debate takes place now is is to say that, for example, in Britain, say this is British culture. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you you come in and, and, and do as we do. Uh, which is as reactionary as saying, you know, this is Muslim culture, or Islamic culture. You know, we we must do this. We must right. do things in this way. Right. Um, so the, the government so, of Quebec saying you cannot send your children to an English-speaking school is essentially their way of being assimilationist. I think, I think it's, it's not a question of um, you can't send these children to, to an English-speaking school. It, it is more that there, there are certain things that are seen as... Um, assimilationism has, has become a means of pointing out the difference of other mm-hmm. who, 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 who are... Who are um, uh, seen as being unable to assimilate, uh, they're, they're not one of us. I mean, it comes out very, very well in France. Because France has got a very long um, Republican tradition, um, assimilationist tradition, and, and I'm very much uh, a supporter of, of the French Republican tradition. Nevertheless, um, uh, the, 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 the assimilationist policies in France are about pointing up the difference of those who, who are deemed uh, incapable of assimilating into French culture. Sure. Yeah, I mean, it's it's obviously the same here, or this idea of orderly assimilation. We need to reduce immigration quotas so because it's happening too fast for us to assimilate. And the, the question then becomes, what does that mean? I mean, and then, then you go back to all those questions about cultural preservation. What does it mean for your culture to be decaying if, if culture yeah. is something that's constantly Precisely. fluid? Yeah. Precisely. The, the, the immigrants somehow change the essence of what it what, what American culture is or British culture is or French culture is rather than a, a, you know a culture always changes and, 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 and the change that, that immigrants bring about is part of the change that, that culture always goes through right uh, well will you tell us uh, briefly before we go about your your latest book and and what inspired you to write it uh, the, the one that's coming out in yeah, the spring. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's called From yeah. Fatwa to Jihad, um, and it's about the, the Rushdie affair and, and, and its legacy. Um, it's the 20th anniversary. Um, it's, it's just the 20th anniversary of the, the publication of the Satanic Verse has just, just gone. The 20th anniversary of the Fatwa um, is next February. Um, ah. So I'm using that as a peg to look at um, the, the kinds of uh, issues and themes that, that uh, the Rushdie affair raised um, uh, about radical Islam, uh, the relationship between Islam and the West, uh, questions of multiculturalism, and questions of particular free speech uh, and, and the limits of tolerance and so on. Uh, and, and to show how, how um, it's the myths about the Rushdie affair um, that, have, uh, 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 that have created uh, the monsters of, uh, that, that we all fear today. Um, for instance, you take something like free speech um, and compare the response to uh, the satanic verses to the response to the Jewel of Medina, Sherry Jones's book, mm-hmm. um, which I, I don't know if, if people know much about. It, she, Sherry Jones is an American journalist who wrote a book called The Jewel of Medina uh, about Aisha, uh, the, one, uh, the, the daughter of um, uh, the, the wife of Muhammad, his, his youngest wife. Uh, who was a child bride. And it's a kind of breezy um, historical romance. Uh, 
Anyway, Random House had, had, had bought the book in America um, for $100,000 and were about to publish it. They sent it to a number of academics to try and get uh, uh, endorsements to, to use in the books. And one of the academics, Denise Feldberg, who's a, a professor of um, uh, Islamic history, I think at the University of Texas. Anyway, she uh, wrote back, um, outraged, that this was an, eff- this, this was an offensive book. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, it did not treat Muslims seriously. It did not treat Islamic history seriously. Random House dropped the book instantly. Right. Um, uh, uh, no other major American publisher would touch it. Uh, no, 20 years ago, a fatwa, a death sentence against, uh, effectively against Salman Rushdie, um, which forced him into hiding for 10 years, um, which uh, meant that publishers, uh, translators were assaulted, were killed, bookshops were firebombed, um, Penguin staff had to wear fireproof, uh, bombproof vests and so on. And yet Penguin continued... Uh, to publish the book. These days, all it takes is a, an outrage, uh, uh, is an email from an outraged uh, academic. Right. Uh, and and, 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 and is 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 that a the commentary was because... on Penguin, or that's Penguin taking the temperature of the culture and seeing that they're going to have to pay in, in sales or whatever else if they do accept this book? Uh, no, I, well, random house, you mean? Um, random no, house, I, I, I think what's happened is that is that over the past twenty years, the fatwa has become internalised. Okay. That effectively, uh, uh, Western culture, Western societies have um, accepted that it is wrong to give offence, um, and that um, we, we do our best. Um, publishers, writers, editors um, uh, do not want to uh, give offence if at all possible. Um, I mean, if you go back to the Danish cartoons, um, it was interesting, the response of Danish cartoons, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, people like um, uh, Jack Straw, the the British Home uh, Foreign Secretary at that time, saying how wonderful it was that British newspapers and magazines did not republish the cartoons, and it was very disrespectful um, that those um, European ones who did. Bill Clinton um, uh, saying how outrageous it was that uh, the cartoons were published in the first place. There's a kind of general feeling that one must not give offence. Um, and I think, in, in a sense, the, the critics of, of, of Rushdie, um, uh, the, the campaigners against uh, the satanic verses, lost the battle because, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it, because the, the, the satanic verses continued to be published. But they won the war because uh, the kind of world that, that they were looking for has, has come to be. And it's come to be because liberals have lost their bottle, have lost their spine. Well, that sounds very provocative, and uh, I hope you'll come back on so we can talk about that when uh, in the spring. Definitely, yeah. Great. Well, thank you so Good much. Good to talk to you. Bye. Bye-bye.